adopted a strategy. You only have to see the press conferences, Condoleezza Rice, George Bush, um, Donald Rumsfeld. It's all on first name. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Helen? Yeah, April? David? Yes, Randy. John? What do you know about the sourcing of the British... Republic? But the relationship between American journalists, particularly television journalists, and the centers of power has become incestuous. So close, because an argument could cut you off from access to the center of power, so close that it is impossible any longer to convey what you know about the centers of power. All you can do is say what you think they mean and what you know they say. So what's the point of journalism? Nineteen ninety one marked the beginning of a series of peace efforts. Of the most recent and well known were the negotiations that took place in the summer of two thousand at Camp David with then President Bill Clinton, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat, and former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. The aftermath of their breakdown is perhaps the clearest example of the Israeli PR machine at work. There are two pieces of this narrative that the Israeli propaganda machine has been very effective in convincing everybody of. The first is that what happened at Camp David was that Barack made the most generous offer that any Israeli ever had or would make. Arafat answered with violence. The charismatic crusader for a Palestinian homeland has rejected what many thought was the best peace deal he could get, and he's failed to stop the terror. In fact, two years ago, Ehud Barak did lay it all out on the table. A Palestinian homeland, giving back over 90% of Jewish settlements, even a plan which divided Jerusalem. What was being offered to the Palestinians was an impossible deal that no Palestinian leader could possibly have accepted. They proposed creating a Palestinian state in most of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But this state was not going to have control over its borders. It was not going to have control over its airspace. It was not going to have control of the only resource, natural resource in that area, which were the major aquifers. And it was going to be bifurcated and crisscrossed by uh, Israeli settlements and Israeli roads. So it was going to be broken up into at least four or five different pieces. It was a nominal Palestinian state within a effectively a greater Israel. It's as if the Palestinians have been put in the basement of their house and they, you know, might be allowed most of the rooms, but Israel can, gets to control all of the hallways and some of the rooms. So you want to go from your living room to your bedroom, you got to go through an Israeli checkpoint. You want to go, you know, from your kitchen to your bathroom, you got to go through an Israeli checkpoint. Well, do you really control your house under that set of circumstances? It did not offer Palestinians un, uh, unimpeded access to their holy sites, and it did not offer Palestinians um, any solution to the three million Palestinian refugees who live in these refugee camps under horrendous conditions. The occupation was not uh, being uh, dismembered, it was being made more efficient. It was being consolidated, where Israel would maintain its strategic interests, whether it be hilltops, whether it be water, whether it be different agricultural things that they had interests in, and uh, the Palestinians would have what was left, basically. And if they wanted to call it a state, they could call it a state. If they wanted to print postage stamps, they could print postage stamps. If they wanted to have a national anthem, feel free. The second myth that the Israeli PR machine was able to spin was that Arafat, having rejected the deal of a lifetime, then incited the Intifada out of spite. The failure of these negotiations which the United States uh, supported in which the Israelis made serious offers, uh, that the Palestinians in uh, leadership decided on a strategy of street fighting as a response. When this latest round of violence broke out, if you look at the editorials that ran in the big American newspapers, they overwhelmingly said that the cause of the violence was uh, Arafat's rejection of, of the Camp David Accord, and they, they blamed the Palestinians, and they sided with Israel. This intifada 
had very little to do with Camp David, because on the ground, uh, parallel to uh, what the, the, the leaders were talking about, who had become so many talking heads as far as the average Palestinian was concerned, you had ongoing land expropriation, tree uprootings, uh, road building, settlements were being expanded at a quicker pace under Barak than they had been under uh, Netanyahu. Unfair water allocation, by which many Palestinians in the summer and fall have approximately two hours of running water a week, when next door you can have a settlement with green lawns and a swimming pool. So what are people supposed to think? Rightly or wrongly, this said to people, this is not a peace process. And even if it is, by the time it's concluded, everything I have is going to be gone. It's going to be expropriated. So what's in it for me? On September 28, 2000, Ariel Sharon, then Israel's defense minister, sparked the Palestinian Intifada with a provocative visit to a site in Jerusalem, holy to both Jews and Muslims. Surrounded by hundreds of riot police, Sharon strode onto the contested sacred site as a demonstration of Israel's control of the area. Sharon was met with protests from Palestinians who began hurling rocks at police and who then stormed the holy site. Israeli riot police fired tear gas and rubber bullets at the protesters. The rioting quickly spread to other parts of East Jerusalem and to Ramallah in the West Bank. Dozens, both Israelis and Palestinians, were injured. The Palestinian Intifada had begun. Public relations works not only by controlling the content of media reports, but also by making sure that some voices are never heard. The marginalization of the Israeli peace movement in the American media is an example of how this works. It's been the point of view of the Israeli peace movement for years that the fundamental cause of the conflict uh, is the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land and, and the settlement policies. Um, but that view is considered in the United States something that's extremely marginal and that you, you rarely see that, uh, that view put forward in the American media. We, in the Women's Peace Camp in Israel, organized a mass vigil of women in black and a mass march through the streets of Jerusalem. 2,000 women strong, both Israelis and Palestinians. Can you picture that dramatic moment 2,000 women dressed in black marching down the streets of Jerusalem to the walls of the old city where we hung banners from the walls of the old city saying peace in three languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and English. And guess what? It didn't get into the media. That's not the kind of image that the media wants to create because then it, all these images of Jews and Arabs working together, of Palestinians wanting peace, would create a kind of dissonance. It would contradict the message that the media has been giving us for years and years. Then how do you explain it? You can't explain it. One of the many groups working for peace inside the occupied territories that has not received coverage in the United States is the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. The committee's work has attracted a range of Israelis committed to peace, including Israeli soldiers. Our role is to go there and to rebuild Palestinian homes as a constructive way of resisting occupation. We're going to a Palestinian village and we're standing shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand, with Palestinian people who wish to have peace with Israelis and in that way where a lot of Palestinians are seeing that there are other Israelis, not the one who demolishes, but others who are rebuilding, and it keeps a flame of hope for a better future. <laughs> 